Jane Derby with Senator Leahy's staff, and I'm co-chair of the planning committee with Heather Gagno, and we have a whole group of planning members. Woo um, so thank you to everyone who makes this event possible, volunteers, staff, uh, exhibitors, everyone really pitches in, the presenters. I heard great things about the morning workshops, so I'm really looking forward to those evaluations. Um, so moving forward, um, I think most of you know by now, Senator Leahy's office has partnered with Change the Story, which is over here at their booth. They've been a, they were very much a part of the morning and afternoon workshop planning. We're very grateful that they devoted a lot of time to help partner with us this year to make this all happen. So um, great for Change the Story. They've got four major reports over there on their table that I have read through. They're great, and everybody should, should give it a read. Um, so they are going to present this afternoon session, and I will be back up on stage in an hour and a half. And now I'd like to introduce Rebecca Haslam, who is one of our morning presenters. And she can take it from here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I have um, the pleasure of introducing to you an amazing group of slam poets from Burlington and South Burlington. Um, they are called Muslim Girls Making Change. Uh, we have three of the four members here today. Um, I just want to tell you, these women, these young women, are doing amazing work. Uh, locally, nationally, they've gained um, recognition, they've won awards, they have been asked to perform uh, all over the state because they have been shifting the narrative around what it means to be a Muslim female in America. Um, they are combating stereotypes, they are bringing voice and empowerment to young women of color everywhere, and um, we are so lucky to have them here today. So I want to introduce to you Balkisa Abdi Qadir. <laughs> Lena Janawi and Hawa Adam. Hello, my name is Balkisa. I'm a senior at Burlington High School. My name's Hawa. Uh, I'm a senior at Burlington High School as well. Uh, my name's Lena. I'm a senior at South Burlington High School. And Kieran couldn't be with us here today. She's in Atlanta. Um, Doing need more change. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to kick off. Yeah, they're going to do a poem. I just wanted to introduce myself because later on we're going to be doing a group poem. Okay, so um, our first poem is called Women's Role. And just a little disclaimer before we start, I just want to point out that this is a cultural issue, not a religious issue. I just wanted to make, that, make sure you guys thought that was clear because, you know, we're in the hijab, but I just wanted to make sure it's a cultural issue. But feel free to snap throughout the poem, or whenever yeah. you feel like whenever you really you, like a line, or right. resonate with it. Yeah. Yeah. Towel hood, mop, washcloth. Do, Do I look like, like a cleaning, cleaning supply to you? Do, Do I, I leave, leave your floor squeaky clean? I mean, yeah, I do. Right, Mom? OK, fine. The, the truth th is, we just watch a nice episode of Hoarders and think, damn. Our house looks great. The laundry's done. I done did the dishes. I vacuumed so much that my back's about to break. Talk about 13 going on 30. Woo! This is slavery. I already did my time. Why are women's hands meant to craft the art of cooking, cleaning? Boy, I even do babysitting. Is it because mop sounds like mom? Is the kitchen the only home for our mothers but there are no welcome mats for our fathers? Why does the stove bring comfort like a fireplace only when the food is done? Open your eyes, because us women have bared this heat much longer than that. The gates of hell have been opened much longer than that. This heat has scorched our ancestors' skin so much so that it has engraved itself in ours. This is our bloodline. We do not take the names of our husbands, but the burdens of our mothers. Our brothers are taught to clean, but it has been guaranteed for women upon the womb. Why do women receive no credit? Do the creases in our hands not allow for justice, equality? Does this sweat not mean hard work? Is it just casualty? Does this blood not remind you of the aftermath of a genocide? We serve men as if this is worship, as if a temple allows for the cracked bones of a servant. Haven't you heard? A slave is only one if they are useful, strong enough, helps a master uphold his status. To you, I hold nothing but the rank of my father, that my labor most is happiness. Is this what it means to be a real woman? As if nothing else matters? 
As if 2017 can't just still come on the warning sign. Never let your son or husband enter. A line repeated over and over and over again that has become a promise, an expectation, a ticket to womanhood. This is what it looks like to be a woman, to be rewired back to the same routine, but still tick, tick, tick. So when I looked at the order of, of things on the agenda, I didn't think about what it would be like to have to follow Muslim Girls Making Change. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Carrie Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women. We're one of the partners of Change the Story. And I'd like to thank Senator Leahy for partnering with us and for hosting us here and putting on this conference. And I'd like to thank Vermont Technical College as well. Um, and I have... Uh, uh, memory of the first time I was ever at Vermont Technical College was back in 1996 and it's when I came here to take a job working for the Women in Technology Project which was a great program getting girls to come to campus and try their hand at non-traditional things like welding and carpentry and auto mechanics. It was great <laughs> and I'm so pleased that Vermont Technical College is still doing that kind of work and still recognizes how important that is. Um, it would have been great if I could stand here 21 years later and say, oh, we don't need that kind of thing anymore, it's all solved. But unfortunately, as we all know, we are still working on that. And the Vermont Commission on Women has been working on e opportunities and equality for women since 1964, and Vermont Works for Women has been doing it for how long, 25 years, 30 years? 30 years, okay, thank you. And the Vermont Women's Fund has also been working on these same issues for a very long time. And all of us turned to each other and said, why are we still doing this? Why are we not seeing the kind of progress in women's economic security in Vermont that we all expect and want to see? So we decided we were gonna join forces. We created this partnership called Change the Story because we're tired of the same old story. We wanna change it. Yeah. <laughs> And we can't do this by ourselves, and nobody would expect any of us to do it by ourselves, which is why we're bringing people together here, which is why we're trying to spread the word everywhere we go so that all of us together can change all of our stories. And we realized that in order to uh, do a really good job with this, we were going to need to tell the story first. So what's the story for women in Vermont? What's women's economic story in Vermont right now? So we did, embarked on a year and a half two-year-long process of really intense research and data collection. We decided we were going to dig very deep and find out how are things actually looking for women, how are women doing. And it was, we had involved lots of contractors who worked with us, we brought in experts and consultants, and we mined every data source we could find. And on that back table, the Change the Story table, you'll see the results of that work, four different reports that we came out with that all tell a little different piece of the story. And uh, after I'm done speaking, you're going to hear some individual stories about actual people and how these things affect their real lives. But I'm going to just stay at the 30,000 foot level for a few minutes and give you kind of that broader story. So there's a little context to go into. And you'll all notice that you've got index cards or sticky notes. Maybe you sat on them, maybe you, you picked them up, but just hang on to those because we're going to use those a little bit later on. All right, so just give you a, um, I have a lot of data that I'm going to give you, and I don't have any visual aids, so you're just going to have to hang tight, just hang on while I throw numbers at you. Quick overview. Women, as you probably know, are 51% of Vermont's population. 66% of Vermont women are in the labor force, and that compares to 69% of Vermont men, so it's very, very similar. And what's really interesting is that if you look at that labor force participation at different ages in people's lives, it peaks during the child rearing years. So women are, at a time when you might think that they're working less and they're staying home, raising their kids, they're actually working more. And so when we think about all the working moms who are in the workforce, the need for childcare really becomes a very obvious issue that they have to contend with, that we all have to contend with if we want to keep women working. 
Women are much more likely to work part-time than men are, and they're nine times more likely to say they choose to work part-time or they have to work part-time because they have family care responsibilities. So women are really taking on a much greater proportion of the responsibilities for what happens at home than men are. Um, I will say that for this research that we did, we only looked at women who work full-time in Vermont. And so all of the numbers that I tell you, all the percentages and everything and the earnings, that reflects women who are working full-time year-round. But if we look at part-time workers, 71% of them are women. So kind of your typical part-time worker is a woman. And a lot of them are not choosing to do that necessarily, but they feel that they have to. So we end up with a situation where in Vermont, women are more likely to live in poverty. They're more likely to live in economic uncertainty and precarity than men are. 57% of Vermont women who are working full-time are making less than $30,000 a year. And 57% of Vermont men working full-time are making more than that. So there's a disparity there. We also see that 13% of Vermont families with minor children are living in poverty. But if we look just at the families that are headed by a single mom, 37% of those families are living in poverty, which is a striking number of people when you think about your neighbors and your friends and the people that you know. <laughs> That's for dramatic effect, that noise. <laughs> so this is serious stuff. And then 43%, an even higher number of women who are working full-time are not making enough to meet their basic needs. So the Vermont Legislature's Joint Fiscal Office comes out with an analysis on a regular basis of how much does it actually cost to live in Vermont, to raise a family. So this is different from the minimum wage. This is different from the poverty level. This is just kind of realistic. If you're paying all of your basic expenses, how much money do you need? And 43% of women who work full-time aren't making that much money. So think of all the scraping by and all of the people who are making it work somehow, but every day is a strain. And I think that there's actually kind of a little bit of an invisibility to those 43% of women who are maybe not qualifying for public assistance, maybe they, they have a car and you know, they look like they're holding it all together, but every day is really kind of a strain. And when we look at what's happening to women who are in retirement, the situation starts to look even more grim. Because of a lifetime of lower earnings and working less, women don't get as much Social Security income when they retire. So in Vermont, the average Social Security income for women is $10,000 a year. And the average for men is $20,000 a year. So those aren't very high numbers for anybody, it's true, but it's twice as much for men. It makes a huge difference in retirement. So we wanted to look a little bit at kind of what are the explanations for this, where, why does, is some of this going on, and, and part of it is where women work. Women tend to be clustered in fields that pay less, men tend to be clustered in fields that pay more. And what was really interesting, one of the things we found is that when you go back in time, when you look at 40 years ago and see where women were working, we see that in 1976, 100% of nurses were women and 98% of office administrators were women. In 2013, do you know how many, what percentage of nurses were women? 93, 93%. 98% of office administrators in 1976 were women. Any guess what it was in 2013? 98%. <laughs> And teachers, 66% were women in 1976 and 67% in 2013. So again, we see things haven't really changed that much. And it's important because those jobs where women are tend to pay a little bit less. So for example, in Vermont, an elementary education teacher makes about $45,000 a year. And an engineer in Vermont makes about $75,000 a year. And as you know, most elementary school teachers are women and most engineers are men. And so, a one strategy to try to address that is to encourage more women to go into engineering and more women to go into STEM fields, which is a great thing to do, and we really need that to happen. We also need to ask ourselves, why is it that the jobs that women are in pay less? Why is it that the caretaking jobs, the human service jobs, the childcare, teachers, why, why do we pay less than we do 
engineers, for instance. Not that engineers shouldn't make a lot of money for all, all the VTC people who are listening. <laughs> Um, and another thing that we looked at we, uh, was women's business ownership. So we saw that there's a huge difference. You all probably know about the wage gap. You've all probably heard about that, that women in Vermont are making about 84% of what men in Vermont are making overall when you combine everything together. When you look at the revenue generated by women-owned businesses, it's 19% of the revenue that men-owned businesses are generating. So for every dollar that men's businesses are making, women's are making 19 cents. So, a little more bad news. <laughs> I'll give you some good news in a minute, I promise. <laughs> but when we look at the higher levels within occupations or within categories where people tend to make more money, we see fewer and fewer women as we go up the ladder. So for instance, if we look at the 100 top grossing corporations in Vermont, out of all of those 108 of them have CEOs who are women. And if you take out the nonprofits from that group, then there are four who are women. And um, another thing that we look at, here's where a little good news comes in, is, issue, is positions of power and authority and decision making. Who's really in charge of things? Who's making the decisions? And, um, I've heard Governor Kunin say many times, and some of you have probably heard her say many times, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> so we need to be at the table. And in our legislature in Vermont, we're doing a great job with that. We have 39% of our legislature is women, which is second by like two tenths of a percent or something to Nevada. So, you know, statistically it's the same. So we're, we're just about the best in the country at that, which is great news. And um, we also, when we look at the high up positions of leadership in the governor's administration, Governor Scott set a record this year when he appointed his cabinet and his administrative leadership, 43% of them are women. And it's never been that high at the beginning of a governor's term before, that, as far as we know. We didn't go back all the way through history, but we didn't, we didn't think we had to go back to when there were zero women for centuries. <laughs> But we only have one statewide office holder, our treasurer, who is a woman. Only 21% of our select boards are made up of women. And we only have one mayor in Vermont who's a woman. But she's here, right? right. There she is. So. <laughs> and then. We thought it would be interesting to look at kind of what's going to happen in the future as we're projecting into the future. Where, what, or will we see some changes? So we're kind of looking at the pipeline. So we looked at uh, things like enrollment in tech centers in non-traditional fields, and things aren't looking too great there. So for instance, 9% of the students who graduated from IT programs in Vermont's tech centers were girls, 5% uh, in architecture and construction. and. And we looked at apprenticeships as well to see what, what people are preparing for. 3% of the people preparing to be plumbers are women. 2% of the apprentices in a, in, to be electricians are women. 98% of the childcare apprentices are women. So it's not going to look a lot different in the future unless we make some changes now. And in addition, um, we looked at high school classes, AP classes. Girls are enrolling at very similar rates to boys in high level math and science, but it's not translating into their majors. They're not choosing to major in math and science and engineering at the same rate that boys are. So that's a little bit of a disconnect there that we haven't quite figured out. But another, a positive note for the future might be women-owned businesses, again, where we see that the rate of women starting their own businesses is incre has increased 15% in the past five years compared to 6% for men. Yep, so that's great. And then also we were talking about revenue before, the rate of revenue growth is up 29% for women-owned businesses, which is pretty good compared to 18% for men. So there's a little catching up going on there. So what does all this mean in terms of actual people's lives. So that's what we're going to hear from next. We have a series of storytellers who are going to tell you their own personal stories. And uh, hopefully we can kind of get a sense of where do we go from here. 
And to facilitate our afternoon, I want to bring up Tiff Bloomley, who is the director of Change the Story. And Tiff has been uh, visionary for getting Change the Story launched and pulling us all together and making it all happen. Before that, for 17 years, she was executive director of Vermont Works for Women. And she's simply one of the strongest champions Vermont women have. Thank you, Tiff. <laughs> One of the things that I encountered when I would go and see, you know, legislators um, like Allison Clarkson, I'd, I'd, I'd be talking and, and, I, and, and I would be asked, not by Allison, but by a lot of others, well, where's the data? And we didn't have the data because data in Vermont is largely not disaggregated by gender. So that's why we had to do the number crunching that we did to produce those four reports. Plus, there's also stuff that we were interested in that's not being tracked by anybody. Now, people are saying, well, you know, fine and dandy that you've got the data, but what about the stories? <laughs> and, okay, which brings me to the program um, at hand. Um, stories are really, they have enjoyed a renaissance, I think, in recent years. The moth kind of being the most uh, visible example of storytelling that has reached broad audiences um, and engaged people at the local level. Um, in fact, one of the people who is going to be speaking today is a moth Grand Slam winner in Burlington. Um, but we decided to I think that there are, the, the, one of the things that, uh, that I have learned over the last 20 years when I've worked with women and girls, mostly adult women, is that they don't tell their stories. So why don't we tell our stories? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, well, we don't really think we have that much to say. It, or our experiences aren't really very different from anybody else's. Or, uh, we don't want to toot our own horns. I mean, there are a lot of different reasons. But I would argue, and I think everybody probably in this room would argue that stories are critical to understanding, making sense of the world around us, to diagnosing the problems that exist, and to figuring out what, what we can do. And we need to listen to them. We need to invite them. And, uh, and, then, and then we really need to pay attention to them and allow them to inform the decisions that we make as educators, as parents, uh, as policymakers. So we have invited five um, amazing people to come and talk about their experiences. Um, and uh, I, I'm, their bios are in your folders. So. I'm not going to read the whole bio. I'm really going to introduce each person separately with a single line because their stories will tell you um, uh, a lot more about who they are. So our very first speaker is Prudence Pease of Tonbridge, speaker, trainer, bringing new awareness to the issue of poverty. Hi everyone. So my name is Prudence Pease. So how many of you have ever heard me speak? And we have some hands in the room. So I will tell you a little bit about myself. I am 52 years old. I was born and raised in the state of Massachusetts. At the age of 20, I gave birth to my first child. When I walked into the hospital to give birth to my son Nico, I had never received any prenatal care. I had never seen a doctor. And when, with Nico still in utero, I weighed a total of 103 pounds. Today, you would need to take 80 pounds off my body frame to make me that young girl again at the age of 20. And on Nico's first birthday, my daddy came from Vermont and he said, this will not do. 
Nico and I were living in a condemned mobile home. So how many of you on the way here today drove by something that you could see that looked like a condemned mobile home? We can find that in every community, can't you? You see me. And my daddy said, come to Vermont, it will be better. And I moved to South Royalton, and I lived with my daddy, his girlfriend, her two daughters, my younger sister, myself, and Nico. How large was our apartment? It was one bedroom. And by the time Nico turned three years old, he had never had a bureau, he had never had a toy box, he had never had a bedroom. He had slept every night of the first three years of his life on the floor on a mat beside me in the crook of my arm. And the state of Vermont stepped up and they looked at me and they said, Prue, we don't believe you have the potential to raise this child. Nor do we believe you have the capacity to learn the skills to raise this child. Do you know what I said to the state of Vermont? Starts with the sixth letter of the alphabet, and you can count that yourselves. <laughs> okay? I've never lost custody of my son, Nicholas. Nico the Horrible is what we call him. But from that day forward, there is not a program in this state that you can identify that I have not been part of, either by choice or by mandate. Welfare Mom, 18 years, Department of Children and Families, WIC, Visiting Nurses, Head Start, Community Action, Weatherization, Fuel Assistant, Visiting Nurses, any program that you can identify, I have used. So how many of you think Nico's my only child? Oh no, when you look around your communities, how many of you ever looked at that young woman? How many of you can pull out the woman that you have targeted that has no potential? Because I think we do that all the time. Okay, I have six children by five men. How many of you can pick that woman out of your community? There is not a rotten name that I have not been called. So, where am I today? Today, I work for Granite United Way. I have helped to design and implement a program called Working Bridges in the Upper Valley. Granite United Way looked around our community and they said, in our community, we see a group of people on the far left who receive state assistance. We see a group of people on the far right whose income is sufficient enough that they have been able to build a resource net for themselves. And in the middle, we see a group of people who work every day who are precariously parched. I work with those groups of people who are precariously perched. I am embedded in 10 companies in the Upper Valley. I see an average of five to 10 individuals in their workplace every day doing resource coordination. I loved it when Tiff spoke and she talked about not telling the story. There is a huge taboo that I find in our culture that says if you come from poverty and you make it out of poverty, you should never ever tell that story. And professionally, I've had people say to me, Prue, you make us uncomfortable when you talk about where you came from. You make us uncomfortable. So about 12 years ago, an initiative came into my life and it's called Bridges Out of Poverty. And I now train all over the United States. I train about one day a week. I train groups for as small as 12. My largest group has been 750 people. And I have talked and told my story and trained that there is a difference between poverty and middle class. So how many of you have picked up those change the story reports? Okay, so I got one and I read it. And the first time I read it, I set it aside. I could not internalize the data. And then I read it again, and I read it again. And my name is Prudence L. Pease. And what I came to understand is that how I internalize who I am is that that L has stood for less than. I am less than other people in my community. And when I read the data in the, in the first report that they issued, every piece of data I saw myself reflected in. 
I was less than, and I was entitled to less respect, less resources, less encouragement, that I was less than. So what I want you to take away from here when you leave here today is the next time you pass a young woman in your community, and that little voice in your head goes off and you think she has no potential, or you hear less than and you put that label on her, I want you to think of me, because I'm not less than. I'm not less than, okay? I, when given opportunity, have been able to take that opportunity and move forward. The last thing I want you to take away with you is I want you to take away a concept that I teach every day called tyranny of the moment. And when we teach tyranny of the moment, what we teach is that if you are living in poverty, every action, every task that you do will take you five to seven times longer to complete than if you are living in a financially stable household. Every task will take you five to seven times longer to complete. How many of you own a car? How many of you, when you go grocery shopping, can put all your groceries in the car at one time? Now make me a single mom. Give me a two-year-old and give me a, a child that's less than the age of one. I now have to walk to the grocery store. If I have a two-year-old and a baby, how many bags of groceries can I carry? Two, how many days a week do I have to shop? Every other day or every day. How many of you get to shop once a week and you can put everything in your car and go home? That's one task. I now have to do that task maybe four or five days a week. Every task takes me five to seven times longer. And it is across the board. It is, it, is, it is your laundry, it is your grocery shopping. It's as easy as picking up a prescription. How many of you have ever gone through the drive-thru? How long does it take you to pick up a prescription? One minute. As a Medicaid mother, I never walked into a, pres in, into a pharmacy to have a prescription filled where they ever started to fill the prescription before I arrived. Because what was their mental model? What was their rule? If she's on Medicaid, she moves all the time. We can't fill her prescription until she has documented what her address is. For me to get a prescription, we're talking an hour. It takes you five minutes. It takes me an hour. Okay? That's what I want you to go away with. I want you to start to look at every woman as she has potential. And I want you to remember that what takes you five minutes takes me an hour. Our second storyteller is Lisa Ryan of Rutland, newly elected alderman and community justice advocate. Welcome. Can you hear me? Okay. During the time in which I was campaigning for a seat on the Rutland City Board of Aldermen, I remembered thinking to myself, as a person who hates politics and who has hated politics her entire life, what in God's name am I thinking getting involved in city politics? When I returned to Rutland from Philadelphia in 2011, I was shocked by how much my city 
the place that I was lucky enough to call home had changed in just four short years. There were a lot of negative things happening in Rutland, things that were difficult for me to comprehend. Drug activity and crime rates were at an all-time high, leading to a nationwide depiction of Rutland, Vermont, as the small New England city battling a serious heroin epidemic. There were acts of discrimination and distrust within a local school system and within our local law enforcement department. Pure, real racism. I was so angry that the place that I once loved was nearly unrecognizable to me. So what did I do? Well, at that time I felt that it was easier to take part in all of the negativity than to diverge from it. I complained. I jumped on the I hate Rutland bandwagon. I did not do anything to help change the situation. On the outside, I appeared to be comfortable, maybe even a little bit passive. But on the inside, I was extremely uncomfortable in search of something more, something deeper. Well, I don't know if you've tried sitting and doing nothing, but I have. And to be honest, my biggest problem with it is that it just doesn't work for me. That introspective process and experience allowed me to recognize that by sitting and doing nothing, I was only allowing myself to be part of the problem. I realized that in order to produce change, I needed to be part of the change. I reconnected with my community by volunteering my time and becoming involved in things that interested me and were important to me, like teaching conflict resolution skills at the local jail and participating in uh, Project Vision, an initiative created by the Rutland City Police Department aimed at empowering the community, strengthening neighborhoods, changing the future, and helping people. The more time I was spending in my community, the more I was getting out of it. Eventually, this led me to seek a spot on the Rutland City Board of Aldermen I ran an extremely competitive, financially difficult, and emotionally charging campaign. Some days I was confident, others I was doubtful, and many days I was like, as a person who has hated politics her entire life, what in God's name am I thinking getting involved in city politics? In almost every interaction that I had, whether it be with a friend or with a stranger, I was asked the same initial question. Why are you running? My response was my story, my honest feelings, and a longing to understand. I wanted to have a say in important decisions. I wanted my opinion to be heard and to be valued. I wanted to help the people of Rutland reconnect and maintain their love for and pride in Rutland. I wanted to demonstrate to young people, to young women, that they are critical members of society now and in the future. I wanted to be a leader and I wanted to bring some diversity to the city. I was most concerned with people getting the wrong message, thinking that I ran because I am black. I was constantly worried about that. I did not even know that I was the first person of color to run and win a seat on the Board of Aldermen. 
until a local newspaper reporter contacted me wanting to interview me. I said yes. When the news article came out titled, Local Woman Makes History, I was excited and I thought it was pretty cool. But again, in the back of my head, I was constantly thinking that people would start to think that I ran because of the color of my skin. It is not now why, and it was not then. Through this journey, I've had to self-reflect and remind myself that whatever anybody thinks of me and or why I ran is their problem. It is not my problem. <laughs> I know who I am and I know what my values are. I know what I think. I know why I ran, and really, that's all that matters. Thank you. Thank you. Our third speaker, is Judy Pransky. She's from St. Johnsbury, an early educator and a child care activist. Please welcome Judy. Prudence taught me this thing with the microphone. I can meander around. Hi, my name is Judy Pransky, and I actually come from the town of Cabot. I began my career, and you can all read about it. I was a, Boston, a principal in the Boston Public School for five years during desegregation in Mission Hill Annunciation Road projects. Tough, but I loved it. I just loved it. I loved trotting through those projects with my aide, who was checking my back all the time. I came to Vermont. I taught, I created early childhood programs, and then I took on that attitude that Mary Alice McKenzie has. I did not love how schools treated children and families in Vermont, particularly children and families of color, of poverty, of social differences. Okay, thank you. Um, I have devoted the last 32 years of my life to childcare. And I did that because I didn't want to not teach young children. The last thing I did in public education was an early childhood program, a prevention of school failure program for three to five year olds, 30, almost 39 years ago, still going strong today. Now that three to five year olds are really important in terms of educating, um, I feel vindicated. I loved doing creep in Danville, Barnett, Peachum and Walden. What I mostly loved was taking that breath, stepping back, and saying, I'm going to find a way to open my own early education program. And a little background, oldest girl of 10 children, had an older brother. My dad was a plumber. He taught me how to do just about everything. I should have been a plumber. I would have been making $75, $85 an hour. I went... Um, to a friend of mine who was in the hydro business, he inoculated me with hydro fever and I built Emerson Falls Hydroelectric Station on the Sleepers River in St. Johnsbury, purchased the old federal fish hatchery there, it was beautiful. There was a house, you know, of the gentleman who ran the hatchery for many years. It was built in uh, 1898, ran as a federal hatchery till 1930 oh, something, 37, uh, was then run as a state hatchery, and as the population increased along the river in North Danville, those folks um, couldn't keep that water temperature down because they were polluting. The New England Bible Institute came along, or the North American Bible Crusade, bought the property, and then they built an all-electric building in 1973. Whoops, oil embargo, no electricity, 
times were tough, they went bankrupt. So I knew a little bit about bankruptcy because I, we bought that property, 11 acres and all of the buildings for a song and worked hard for a year and built that hydroelectric station, which uh, just ended its 30-year levelized contract two years ago. And I am now an owner of a net metered project in the state of Vermont. So instead of earning 10 cents a kilowatt hour, I earn almost 15 cents a kilowatt hour, which is really exciting. <laughs> What's important about that is that the, that hydroelectric station has funded my childcare center. <laughs> It has funded my child care programs. I've had six. I now have two, a large center and uh, a summer program, Camp Laughing Turtle. And those programs have been funded by me taking money from the hydro, just like it was a bank. Because when I started my business, I was in great shape. I owned the property with my partners. I could move into that house and make a child care center without having to buy a building, without needing to go to a bank. The bank came to me. I started out. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, with a, a line of credit. I was doing so well, a line of credit of $25,000. Within 15 years, it was down to nothing. I never did a thing differently. I paid it when I used it. I was just a woman in business and in, a, in an industry that was kind of a little flaky and didn't make very much money. And I didn't make very much money. In fact, so many years, I lost a lot of money. But anyway, Back at it, I am going to have the best child care programs in the state of Vermont. And I'm going to serve the population that lives in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, and in and around Cabot, Vermont, and the surrounding towns. They are low income. They are struggling. 90, it was 93. Today, it's 95.5% of my children are subsidized. I have never charged the difference between subsidy and the tuition rate. Right now, my tuition rate is a five-star rate, but it's not a market rate. I charge just a little bit over what STARS requires for that level so that folks who aren't subsidized don't feel as scared to death to bring their children to me because they want to. I have a wonderful staff. I've Child Care Food Nutrition has told me how many tens of thousands and thousands of hundreds of thousands of meals that I've served over these 32 years, and they've all been good, and they've all been as good as I could afford in that moment, and I still can afford to do it, and the reason is there's a little more money from STARS, there's good money from the hydro, and I can do it without paying bank costs. I can borrow money from myself and put it back and not have fees and thousands of dollars of fees to have to take a little loan. So that's what I've done there. I've subsidized not just my parents who are low income and eligible for subsidy, I've subsidized people who work at St. Johnsbury Academy and at the local lumber um, company. Why? Because they're not eligible for services. They are folks like many of your children who have children who can't afford childcare and they can't afford not to work. We have to do something about this issue in the state of Vermont. 28 years ago, I pulled down a speech recently. Somebody's going to tell me if I'm going over time because I ramble. I pulled down a speech that I gave to the Senate that said, 30 seconds, that said, we have to address this. We're looking at children who are missing opportunity. They're missing educational opportunity because they don't have any help from anywhere. We have to, my mother said, if you're going to do something, if you're going to do a job, you do it well. We need to do this job well. We need to fund early, early child care, early education in the state of Vermont without making it so difficult for people working in that field to have those jobs. We require amazing amounts of education now to be an assistant in the infant room in my child care center. I have people who've worked for me for 18, 22 years, more than that, and why? Good benefits, vacations, sick time, holidays. I just can't do health insurance. But the reality is, this is a job the state of Vermont has to do better, the business community in Vermont has to do better, and the educational community in Vermont has to do better. <laughs> Love you all.
Thank you, Judy. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Colin Ryan of Burlington, comedic speaker. <laughs> you can come on up. Okay, it's all right. Comedic speaker and a commissioner, of the Vermont Commission for Women on Women. Sorry. Come on. So, um, like you, I am concerned by and convinced of the gender and income inequality that faces our society today. I just got a bug in my eye. That was a weird... Also concerned. Um, and I was lamenting to Lindsay, my wife, about this. And I said, you know, look at me. How can I help... How can I be an ally? What, how can I support? Is there any role I could play? And she said, why don't you apply to join the Vermont Commission on Women? That was not the answer I'd expected. <laughs> I thought, it's just so crazy it might work. And I applied and I was honored to be appointed in 2015. Um, it has been an opportunity for me to learn to be in a room with impressive, strong, successful women, to be inspired by their stories, and to learn so many things. My first order of business was just to listen, and I had I'd read this article about uh, gender discrimination, and we were in the conference room of, the, of our commission meeting, and it was very cold, and I said, I don't know if you know this, I just read this article, it says the average office thermostat is set to the body temperature of a 50-something man in a suit. Isn't that crazy? And they said, yeah, Colin, we've known that for 30 years. <laughs> There's an element of like, good job, Colin, good. Yeah, <laughs> try to keep up. Uh, I came to my first WEOC event uh, three years ago, and it was incredible, and it was mostly women in attendance, and I thought, you know, this is a chance for me to just observe and be a silent supporter. When you come in, they give you a, a raffle ticket, and at the end of the day, they drew a grand prize, and I won. <laughs> I won a spa day. <laughs> that was not the low profile I was going for. <laughs> The past two years has felt like a journey of discovery because I have been exposed to the stories of inequality that women face and the ways that they have overcome them. I have heard stories about architects who took drafting class when they were students, even though they were accused of only doing so to flirt with the boys. And yet they became architects anyway. I have heard stories about female athletes who outshined their male athlete peers and received not accolades, but anger, and they outshined them anyway. I heard a story about a girl who wanted to learn how to weld. Her family would never allow a girl to do something like that, so she taught herself how to weld in an abandoned shed and is now a professional metal worker. These stories have cracked my heart open, and every time they have expanded it just a little bit more, and it helped me to understand if every woman has faced inequality, what is my role, why do I care? And that's when I realized my own story, my mother's story. See, my mom moved to this country, married my father, had me, and then quickly divorced, and all of a sudden found herself an American immigrant without a college degree, and now a single working mother, trying to support a very sick little boy who was constantly in the hospital with asthma. My mother was my hero, my first best friend in life, and I found out later that the moments that I was most proud of and she was most proud of in her work as a secretary and able to provide for me were the same types of moments that people used to talk about her in a sexist way, she walked into double binds. She was blamed for doing her best. You see, inequality has shaped my entire life, which is admittedly 
an odd thing to say because I grew up to be a straight, white, American-born man. Like all the groups that we are frustrated with right now. <laughs> I'm in every single one. But the thing is, I'm not a group. I'm just a kid who was raised by a strong woman. I'm just someone who's sick of it and wants it to be better. <clears throat> and that little boy grew up wondering if maybe being a man, whatever that is, in some way, meant making the world a little bit better for my mom. <sighs> this is always an emotional day. Um, it's not the first time I've teared up today. So, make the world a little bit better for my mom and then my sisters and then my brother and then my father and then me. I thought maybe I can... I mean, what could I do? But I, something about being a man must mean standing up for others. That's all I could picture. So when I joined the commission, I right away thought maybe my experience is a template for other men who want to be allies. Maybe, just maybe. I was invited in and it's changed my life. Maybe there are others out there. So we decided to find out. We decided to find out. The commission um, changes story. A lot of great organizations, myself, not I, okay? We created an amazing event called Male Champions for Change. We invited men from all over the community. We invited sea levels, managers, leaders, movers and shakers. 60 men showed up, and the passion in the room was unmistakable. They said, what can we do to make a difference? And in the conversations that followed, I heard men say things like, I didn't even know what I didn't even know. And we're not the enemy. And all my life I was told, be a man, but no one ever taught me how. I heard one man say, this is the issue I care about the most in my life. I held a series of follow-up potluck dinners. We served chips and beer, and we talked about how to <laughs> be better husbands and partners and allies. And yeah, somebody brought manwiches. <laughs> That's too good of a joke to pass up. They are awful. Um, <laughs> Here's what I've come to believe. Most of the men that you know in the face of inequality do not feel apathetic. They feel powerless because they live in the same status quo that you do and who can change the world? That is why so many men stay silent because they're afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing or they're afraid it's not gonna make a difference. Anyway, this is gonna sound crazy, but what if men need to be empowered to be allies for gender inequality? What if? What if they need help finding their voice? Look, it's not your job. It's not. But it's going to happen faster with your help. When I look at the template of my own experience, I can boil it down to three basic things. Here's your template. Invite, involve, invest. Invite. Look for opportunities not to call men out, but to call men in into greater awareness, into the conversations, into events like this one. Invite them to events like this one. Don't give them raffle tickets. <laughs> right? I mean, we've learned our lesson. If I win today, I will never come back again. I'm so sorry in advance. So that's invite. Invite them to events with women in the name. Tell them that they can be part of this conversation. Involve. Show them that in small ways they can play a role. It could be amplifying the woman in the, on the room whose idea it actually was, right? It could be paying attention to who's washing the dishes and who's taking the notes. Maybe some of these men have never even thought about that before. It's time for them to start 
being aware of that, yeah? And maybe what it means is asking, as crazy as it sounds, for their story. Maybe you ask a man you know, when did inequality show up in your life? Or when did you witness it in the life of somebody who matters to you? So that's involved. Finally, invest. All I can tell you is in the past two years, I have changed a lot. And it is because many of the people in this room have seen potential in me. And they have been patient in all of the moments when I was oblivious, patronizing, defensive, and wanted credit for the smallest thing possible. <laughs> because that's what we do as we change. We mess up, but we try to be better. This experience has changed my work. It has changed my life. Last month, I was speaking at the University of Minnesota in front of 2,500 college students and educators. And I said to them, salary negotiation for the women in this room, this is the number one way that you can personally close the gender wage gap. And it is a learnable skill. And you know what that audience did? They spontaneously started applauding because they get it. And I was so moved by their unexpected applause that I added, I just want you all to know that when you feel alone, you are not alone. You are surrounded by far more allies than you might realize. And that's the same message I have for you today, because it is true. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So our fifth, our fifth speaker today is Melody Walker Brook of Jeffersonville, Abnaki educator, activist, and artist. Welcome. Well, life is hard. Okay. <laughs> Yep, still hard. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm just kidding. I can do it. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So it took a phone call at a scholarship dinner to remind me of my purpose. I was sitting at a table, at a, a whole table full of these wonderful people. Um, it was a scholarship dinner for the Vermont Space Grant. And I was very proud of myself, <laughs> and my family was there, and I was ready to receive this award, right? So afterwards, I walked, I walked out, and my head was held very high with self-accomplishment, and I got a phone call. <laughs> this, this phone call changed my whole life. It changed my perspective and how I walked in the world. It was from a woman that I didn't even know. And I, I, she asked me who I was, is, is this Melody? And I was like, yeah, who are you, right? And she said, well, you don't know me, but I am so proud of you, and you represent us so well. And I, I'm sorry, I was getting emotional at this part. Um, she said, we are, we're here supporting you. And I kind of stepped back and I said, oh, okay, I didn't realize what this, scholarship dinner really represented because I was in my own world and I was just thinking about I'm getting this award and I'm gonna have a great resume and I'm gonna do good things in the world and um, I'm gonna go work for NASA right <laughs> and um, and she grounded me and and at that point I realized that my life and my story aren't just my own right um, so I was one of only a few people uh, at that point to have gone to college from my community. And I represented all of those people, right? So think about, uh, thank you. Uh, 
and think about all the communities that you belong to because you belong to a lot, right? Whether you're the face of your hometown or you are the face of your nation or whether you're part of a tribe, it doesn't matter. We all represent all of these communities, right? Um, and if I fail, they fail. And if I succeed, they succeed. So, my people, we, we attend scholarship dinners, right? <laughs> That's what we do. And all those negative stereotypes can just fly out the window because I'm not going to be one of those stereotypes. I'm, I realized at that point that it matters how I walk in the world, not just for me, but for all of those other people, right? So, okay. And everything that I do positively lifts them up and it gives them spirit back, right? Because think about going to the, at the entrances of the hospitals where they tried to leave people barren through the eugenics project and all the years of warfare and the fight for identity and all of those things that just eat away at your soul, right? I'm giving back to them. That's really great. Right? I, I think about that every day in all of my roles. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, right? If I go to the bathroom, I'm going to clean up after myself, right? So, <laughs> okay, just saying, I probably shouldn't have added that in there. Um, yeah. Um, so whatever path in life that I chose, it was because of all those people that lifted me up and also those people that put you down, right? That drive you on, too. They had a role in who you are, right? So my family and my friends, people like Jim Peterson, and my tribal members, and they all pushed me forward to do what I'm supposed to be doing in the world. And it was at that point that I decided that I was going to throw my life into service. So, I, you know, I have my regular job, right? I work at Champlain, and I teach, and um, I'm the ops manager there, and I do all these other things, but every day I do something for my community, or at least I try. Whether that be calling a, um, a girl that just graduated from college and is going to Dartmouth, yay, right, from our community, and reminding her that she's important, and I support her because that's how you give back to people. You have to pass it on. So I always try to pass on what they gave to me at that dinner. And just this past week, I was elected the chair of the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs. Woohoo! <laughs> so. Um, and someone, someone once told me in my community that every open seat there is an ancestor sitting there telling you, watching you, and helping you to say the right things. So if you think about all of the, all of the open chairs here, you can look beside you, maybe your ancestors are sitting there next to mine, all squeezed into a little chair. Um, and, and at one point, one of my elders had told me that um, our ancestors guide our, our way like fireflies along a summer path. And I would like to think that that is true because I listen. Um, it's as much about listening as it is about doing, right? So, and to really understand a person, look at the motivations that guide them and look at what they seek to protect because that's who you are too. Um, now, juxtapose this with another story that I wanted to tell you because this really cemented for me that being a woman and how I show up matters and that I am, I am needed, right? So during my first years as a professional, I had one of my elders from Maine. He came and visited me at my house and he was making me breakfast and he would you know, pull a chair, he'd have me pull his chair out for him, and he'd have me touch the frying pan, and um, he cooked me breakfast, and he was doing all these things. And I was like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> I don't understand. Um, and he said, we have forgotten how important women are to the world, and the imbalance of the sexes has created many of the problems that we experience. We need more women in every aspect of our lives, to place their shade in everything, whether it be touching a frying pan or serving as a chief. We need more of you, and it starts with creating a space for that. So, just can you imagine a world where every perspective has value and that every person is sacred that comes to the table and all of their gifts that they bring are sacred too. So my chief, Roger Longto, my elder, Jim Taylor and all the other people of my, the members of my community, um, 
they don't just call on me, despite being a woman, to serve my people. They call on me because I am one, and I have all of these gifts that are really unique, and all of us do, and I think that's really beautiful, and they celebrate that by pushing me forward, right? So ultimately, what I have learned is that without women's voices, the world is only half seen, and the work to be done will be unbalanced. Olyani. Thank you, Melody. <clears throat> Actually, let's just a round of applause for all of our speakers. So, um, so what do we hear? We heard that we need to do a lot better to understand the realities of those living in poverty. We heard that we must run for leadership positions or put our hat in the ring to be the leader in that company so that our perspectives can influence what happens. We heard it takes way too much fancy footwork to make childcare affordable and accessible that we have to do a lot better on that score. We heard we have to engage men. This isn't a women's issue. Our, the issues we have been talking about in the workshops and that the reports address, they're not women's issues. They're, they are social justice issues and they are economic issues that are important to the very vitality of our state. And we heard that whether we're aware of it or not, each of us has a role to play, and what we do matters. And that we must support one another in doing the work that we need to do. So how are we going to change the story? I don't have those answers. <clears throat> I have ideas. But Change the Story is designed to be time limited and it's designed as a catalyst. We're not an organization. We're here to try to play a role where we can to advance women's economic security. And if there's anything that I have learned over the last 20 years in my work, it is that we will not make any progress. We will not close the wage gap sooner than another 32 years, which is the current projection, unless all of us are involved and our brothers and sisters are involved and our employers are involved, the men in our lives are involved, higher ed, K through 12, it's going to take all of us because we're talking about, about an adaptive challenge that <clears throat> is ingrained and involves attitudes and priorities and belief systems that are very hard to let go of. In your folders is a, is a sheet that says 15 things you can do. They're just 15. They're, they are um, examples of things that you can do to help change the story. You're all in, you have different jobs, you are in different, you live in different places, you have different um, interests, but uh, we would always, we would all argue that every one of us can do something to move the needle forward faster. And so, on your chairs, was a, an index card or a sticky note. And I'd like you, right now, because we got the time, to take 
a minute and a half, two minutes. I'll give you two minutes to think of one thing, one thing that you will do soon. If not tomorrow, then Monday. If not Monday, then the following Monday. But one thing that you can do that will help move the story for women. So I'm going to give you two minutes, and then I'm going to check back in with you. We want to collect those, if you're willing, um, to give them to us, because this needs to help inform our work. And Jessica Nordhaus, in the back there with, with the box, um, will we'll collect them at the end. But right now, just think about the one thing that you can do. Okay, some of you may not be done, but I'd like to hear a few of you just offer, because they might help inspire those of us who haven't thought of something yet. Um, so anybody want to volunteer or something? Yeah. So, uh, um, so you are um, on the chamber board, and you're going to share the four reports with all of the members of the chamber, and then Diana lets you finish that sentence. So I'm going to share the status reports, and also I had already mentioned the idea of having special um, membership benefits for women-owned business owners, so I'm going to continue to pursue that and make that happen. Yeah. Great. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Let's get it on microphone, because then Megan can actually film you, too. Can you hear me now? Yes. My name's Mary Alice Clark. It's a good name to have today. Um, <laughs> Ten years ago, my husband borrowed behind my back against everything we were worth, and then spent part of it, and then told me he was buying a huge place, and if I wanted to be on the deed, I better show up to the closing. <laughs> um, three lawsuits, he died in the middle of the whole thing, four moves, and selling two houses later, I'm still sort of trying to get out from under. Um, I had a part-time job, with the police, which was very aggravating. <laughs> All of that combined um, was kind of a living hell for a while. And my idea is I'm a writer, and uh, I need to write about it. I need to write down what I learned through all this mm -hmm. so that none of you have to deal with it, because I truly was alone and have been fighting all this. But I got an education like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> dealing with lawyers and realtors and all kinds of things, which I had run from before that point. And so uh, this has forced me today to, to realize all this and to do something. Thank you very much. One more? Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Shelley, and I'm going to commit to, I have two young sons, and so my job is to educate them in the role that they can have in creating a space for equality, and how they can be part of the voice as well. And Colin, thank you, I love your invite and invest, and give me that third one. Involved, thank you, yes, thank you. Yeah, we have time for one more, and then um, all some girls making change are gonna come up again. Yes. Oh. oh. Did I miss someone? Sorry. We'll Sorry. do two quick ones. We'll do two. Very quick. Yeah. This is quick. Very quick. I'm, I'm Patsy White, and um, I want to use Facebook to raise awareness by asking Colin's question, uh, what loved one of yours has experienced inequality? Because men look at us as whiners, but I think if we turn it back to them and say, what did your mother experience or what did your great aunt experience? My great aunt was the assistant postmaster with her father in Fitzgerald, Georgia. And when he died, she applied to become postmaster. And instead, they assigned a man from town and wanted her to train him. And she got on the train to Atlanta, Georgia, 
and just uh, shook her heels in their faces. And that was before the turn of the previous century in, in the early uh, 1890s. So I come from that stock and I hope that the rest of us do too and we need to tell it. Hi, I'm um, on a board of directors for um, a program called Umbrella, which is located in St. Johnsbury, and we serve um, St. Johnsbury, Newport, and the area. Um, I want to challenge Colin to join us in thinking about what we can do. The program, its biggest focus is domestic violence. And it, the, we uh, really work around the woman and her family. And we have an empowerment program called Cornucopia. We have a childcare program. And um, we, have, of course, have a, an advocacy program for the domestic violence. But most importantly, w they need jobs. They need respect. They need help and we need someone that's going to pay attention to this population because generally this is a population that people don't pay attention to they look at and indicate they just say it was your fault and we've got to change the perception we've got to change a lot of things and colin you're first on my list <laughs> Thank you. So before Diane comes up to uh, close us out and draw the winner for the spa um, day, I want to first, I want to thank my colleagues, Jessica Nordhaus and Lindsay Lathrop Ryan for all the work that they did um, to help pull this conference together with, um, from this change the story part. And, <clears throat> and and recognize all that the Commission on Women, oh no, you can't leave. <laughs> the Commission on Women, Vermont Works for Women, and um, the Vermont Women's Fund has done uh, to, to advance these conversations. So without further ado, however, I'm gonna get these things out of your way, and would you, the next generation, please come to the stage. Okay, so we're gonna do one more poem before the day ends. Um, and before we like read the poem or recite the poem, um, just wanted to kind of explain a little bit about it. Uh, so although what unifies us today is being a woman, it's another thing to be a black woman. And I think um, our mission statement is to really highlight our stories and stay, stay true to our stories. So really wanna highlight the fact that we are black Muslim females, and that's another layer all in itself. So considering everything that goes on with like solving this issue, gotta also have us there and have us at the table because these are our struggles. Yeah. And also like just reteaching guys snaps, really keep it going. A human female skeleton was discovered by archaeologists. Her bones old but not cracked. Her layer of skin non-existent. Only pieces of hard tissue. No hair, no breasts, no butt, only cartilage. That is how we all die. With no layers of skin, with no colors to discriminate against, no one to claim worthy or unworthy, no one to look to our past or the melanin tinted of the blood of our ancestors, with no one to say that our black skin is not beautiful our pigmentation too dark, no thief to claim our rainbow of excellence or to snatch any nappy hair off our scalps or take our style, our music, our black. Why is it that my features are only good until a white girl wears it? As if her white makes my black shine, makes my cornrows pop, makes my ass twerk just a little harder, makes my culture relevant. My culture is relevant, 
So let me tell you, Kim K, Miley Cyrus, and Rachel Dozel, my skin glows and my hair defies gravity. Your straight cans can't stand a day beneath this comb. You ain't know nothing about a bad hair day. I try to run my hands through my hair. The comb breaks and my head aches. But that's all a part of it. You ain't never felt that. My tribal clothing is not to be shared, but rather admired, appreciated. I'm magical, straight from heaven. Do not, Do not tell me I ain't. ain't. My melanin is a sun, a goddess, a goddess, begging you to bow down to my beautiful, my honey-tinted sweet skin, my clear don't crack skin, my caramel, my worth a thousand words type of skin. The sparkle that comes from it even makes the stars jealous, makes the earth proud to claim me, my radiance beyond the seven heavens, my skin rich with gems, with the purity of the girls before me, my diamond in the rough, my chocolate, my beautiful, my beautiful. I'm here to say, to speak for the voices of my people who have been shut down by the system, for my girls who have yet to say that they shine, that they matter. Do not tell me I'm too black, too big, too loud. I'm not too loud. I'm just tired of the stereotypes that have been pushed upon me like another layer of skin. White skin, that is. You're beautiful for a black girl, they say. But I know I'm not beautiful until my skin is one shade lighter until my voice is calmer, until my hair is straighter, until I'm white. Thank you. All right, well that pretty much concludes the day and we managed to hold on to a great big crowd all day. So thank you everyone for turning out on a beautiful Saturday day to be with us. Uh, this is going to be the last call for evaluations. You can finish your evaluation, go back there, drop it in the box, wait five minutes, maybe four minutes, and we will give you, well, we'll give you a raffle ticket and then we'll do the drawing in just a couple of minutes, give you all a chance to finish up those evaluations and hand them in. I just want to make an extra shout out to Change the Story, Muslim Girls Making Change, and everybody else who helped make this happen today. Thank you.